We hope everyone is well at this difficult time. I'm Leah Markey, the director of the Center for Renaissance Studies at the Newberry Library. Thank you for attending the center's first public lecture via Zoom. Professor Millian's talk was originally scheduled for April 23rd, but due to the pandemic, we were forced to postpone it. The talk was designed to kick off a project devoted to the study of hybrid or composite books in the medieval and early modern period. We're using these terms hybrid and composite quite broadly to think about books that are part manuscript and part print, books that include images and different types of prints, albums that were compiled by different owners, books with elements from different parts of the world, books with maps, etc. This spring, following Walter's lecture, we had planned to host a one-day workshop devoted to the topic, as well as a three-day conference co-hosted with Walter and Emory University. The Emory conference has now been postponed to October. Before I introduce Professor Melian, I would like to provide a few logistics. As you can see, the chat function on Zoom has been disabled. Please type your questions into the Q&A module. I will read a selection of these questions to Walter following the lecture. The program will last about an hour. I'm honored to introduce you to Walter Melian, who's the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Art History at Emory University in Atlanta, where he's taught since 2004 and currently directs the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry. He chaired the art history department in 2011, 2014, and then again in 2015, 2017. And he was professor and chair of art history at Johns Hopkins University. He has published extensively on Dutch and Flemish art and art theory of the 16th and 17th centuries, on Jesuit image theory, on the relation between theology and aesthetics in the early modern period, and on the artist Hendrik Holtzius. In addition to a four-part monograph on Geronimo Nadal's Adnotaciones et Meditaciones in Evangelia, and the exhibition catalogs on scriptural illustration and on religious allegory in Dutch and Flemish prints of the 16th and 17th century, his books include Shaping the Netherlandish Canon, Carl van Manders' Schilderbuch, and The Meditative Art, Studies in Northern Devotional Print. He is co-editor of more than 20 volumes, too many to list here, some highlights, or rather some of my favorites, include Image and Imagination of the Religious Self in Late Medieval and Early Modern Europe from 2008, Meditatio, Refashioning the Self from 2010, The Anthropomorphic Lens from 2014, Jesuit Image Theory 2016, and more recently, Quid as Secretum, Visual Representations of Secrets and Mysteries in Early Modern Europe. His articles number more than 70. And Walter is currently in the process of completing three books devoted to Carl van Mander, Johannes David, and customized Dutch and Flemish manuscript prayer books. Melian recently completed his term as president of the 16th Century Society. He has been awarded numerous honors in Europe and the US and is a series, a series editor for Brill. Most important to note today is that Walter is a wonderful member of our community at the Newberry who inspires all of us. He is a former fellow and currently is a scholar in residence, co-organizer of our Crest Seminar in European Art, and is Emory's consortium representative for the Center for Renaissance Studies. Thank you for presenting your work with us today, Walter. Thanks so much, Leah. And it's such a great pleasure to be here. And thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. And I should explain that what I'm going to be reading will probably be the last chapter of the book in uh, progress on um, prayer books organized around printed images and produced in the Low Countries between around uh, 1500 and uh, 1650. This is a work in progress, but I hope uh, within a few months it uh, will become the last chapter of that book. So I'll now begin. Issued in 1614 for the express purpose of re-evangelizing the United Provinces, Franciscus Costarus's Het New Testament on his Herren Jesu Christi, the New Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ, consists of a Dutch translation of the New Testament, supplemented by numerous marginal glosses referring to parallel scriptural texts from the Old and New Testaments, and by an extensive interpretative apparatus that underscores the scriptural warrant for key points of Roman Catholic doctrine. 
Whereas the scriptural citations cluster along a narrow columnar band at the left or right of each page, the prose commentary inhabits the wider band adjacent to the numbered scriptural verses. Kosteris construed his explanations as pictures of a sort. For example, with reference to Matthew 6, verses 22 to 23, and Augustine's reading of this passage, he argues that discerning the true meaning of scripture is like looking at images. If one's eyes are healthy and one's vision is clear, then the body will be as if illuminated by the images the eyes behold. Similarly, if one's reading, one's meaning at, of scripture is true, unsullied by false opinions and heresies, then all one's works, having been guided by the gospel, will be as true as these true images. And conversely, if one's eyes are impure or blind, then the rest of one's body, for want of organs of sight, will abide in great obscurity. Likewise, one's reading of scripture will be neither good nor righteous, righteous and one's works will be false. Now, at some point after its publication, probably at mid-century, judging from the many prints issued by engraver publishers, such as Martin van den Einden, Cornelis Haller the Younger, Gaspar Heibrechts, and Alexander Foot the Elder, the owner of the copy of Kosteris' book, now in the Mauritz Sabé Bibliothèque of the Catholic Universiteit von Leuven, inspired by this analogy between seeing and reading, added a second tier of visual glosses interspersing small devotional prints and cropped excerpts from larger prints amongst the marginal comments at right. The owner, as we shall see, may have been a person, male or female, affiliated with the Jesuits, either as a patron, student, or congregant, or alternatively a member of the order, or a third possibility, a corporate entity, say a group of teachers at one of the order's houses of study or the residents of a novitiate house. Costerus, in his dedication to the pious reader, envisions multiple readerships. Having ascribed the impetus for his Dutch New Testament to his superiors in the society, fellow Jesuits, whom he characterizes as learned, he then avers that the book will be profitable, first, to full-fledged Catholics, sure of their faith, but desires of patristic arguments were with the counter heresies. Second, to those in whom the prevalence of heresies has introduced doubts and who wish to be assured of the foundations of their faith. And third, to the heretics themselves who will discover how the unified doctrine of the Roman church has the power to curtail their falsehoods. The longer version of my paper examines the triple function, exegetical, meditative, and controversialist of these inserted prints. Here I want simply to give a sense of the care and ingenuity with which the prints were placed, and to introduce the visual verbal hermeneutic that animates this richly customized book. Kosteris, in his prefatory remarks addressed to the States General of Holland, Zeeland, and their sister provinces, justifies his glossate New Testament on several grounds. He avows that the explanatory annotations are designed to prove that Roman Catholic doctrine, rooted as it is in extra scriptural traditions, sanctified by the fathers and authorized by the church, in no way contravenes the canonical scriptures. Rather, these traditions, as vindicated by his comments, fully complement and amplify the teachings distilled throughout the New Testament in the manner of a well-argued gloss. Against the enemies of the Roman church who claim that she diverges from scripture by cleaving to practices explicitly licensed nowhere in the Bible, Costerus rejoins that these practices originate in unbroken apostolic and patristic traditions founded by Christ himself through the action of the Holy Spirit. Implicitly relying on John 21, verse 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written, every one, the world itself, I think, would not be able to contain the books that should be written. He states that much of what Christ taught the apostles was left unwritten, and nor did he command them to record everything they saw and heard. Moreover, the traditions upheld by the church can also be defended biblically, either because they contravene nothing expressly stated in the Bible, 
or because they can be found to have an exegetical warrant, if not a literal one, by recourse to patristic exegesis. For instance, according to the church fathers, Tertullian and Basel, to name but two, the term consubstantiale, an ender natura in Dutch, though it does not appear in the New Testament, has an apostolic pedigree extending back to the founding of the church, a lineage so authoritative that it can be seen as rooted in the blood shed by Peter and Paul to establish the Roman church. If Costris authorizes his anti-heretical exegetical apparatus by anchoring his glosses in the scriptural writings of Augustine, Ambrose, Gregory, Jerome, Basil, Tertullian, and the other fathers, he does so to defend two traditions of the church in particular, the cult of saints and the cult of images. He views the two practices, the veneration of saints and of images, as virtually identical in that saints are revered as representatives of God and holy images are representations of God and his saints. As the halt, lame, and sick sought to be healed by the shadow of St. Peter in Acts 5, venerating him by way of the image he cast, howsoever imperfect the likeness. So images of the saints are venerated in the way the name of Jesus is honored. It is Jesus himself, not the breath that gives voice to the holy name whom one worships. And likewise, it is not the image, but the person portrayed who is reverenced. Quote, and we honor Christ in this fashion, just as kneeling when we hear the name Jesus, we worship the person of Jesus whose name is thus signified, not the breath that transmits the word Jesus. So too, we honor the saints whom the images signify. What can be said against this? Inasmuch as the fathers of old, for more than 1,200 years, even back to the apostles, have taught and written about it in this wise as they had it from their forefathers. Now, when she appended pictorial images to align with Costras's glosses, the visual exegete who customized her or his copy of Het New Testament was operating within a patristic frame of reference using representational means approved by the fathers to defend the scriptural foundations of the Roman church's age-old traditions. Following Costorus, she was engaging in an activity inspired by the spirit, walking in the footsteps of the fathers whose pronouncements had elucidated the life, death, and triumph of Christ and of his church. The interpolated Bailden, Dutch for images, Bailden, in addition to commenting on the annotations and affiliated biblical verses, exemplify the Catholic commitment to images as secondary sources of primary subjects, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Virgin, the angels, the saints, fit to be worshiped, reverenced, or venerated. But as Costras indicates at the close of his prefatory remarks, she was also doing something more fashioning a counter image of the Jesuit order whose true image had been defaced and despoiled by its heretical detractors. The book's owner responded to these polite yet provocative remarks by appending beatific images of St. Ignatius of Loyola, co-founder of the society, and St. Francis Xavier, one of his foremost followers at the close of the Gospel of Matthew. The oval format of the two portrait prints jives with that of the icon they flank, which depicts Mary sewing a garment for the boy Jesus. While she labors on his behalf, he labors on hers, holding a book, presumably the Bible, and using it to instruct her. The implication is that Ignatius, who displays an open book with the society's mo motto, for the greater glory of God, an allusion to its vocation of laboring for the Lord, and Francis Savior, whose lily alludes to his Marian purity, maintained during years of arduous missionary activity in Asia, are close imitators of both the virgin and child. They apply their hands, minds, and hearts to the task of promulgating the gospel of Christ. The majority of prints have been interjected discreetly. They function singly or in clusters of two or three in close proximity. However, a significant minority cohere in larger clusters extending over several pages. And I should add that there are hundreds of images in this New Testament. 
once they sometimes also refer retrospectively to complementary passages from earlier annotations. One such sequence connects the second half of Mark 15 on the Passion to the opening verses of Mark 16 on the Resurrection. The serial cluster begins with a small image on page 152 of the crucified Christ, closely watched by Mary and John, whose reverent attitudes contrast with those of the two Pharisees who condemn Christ in the full page Ecce Homo interpolated as a facing page. The Pharisees are shown looking at him from exactly the same position and angle of view as Mary and John, but with contempt rather than devotion. One of them even displays the cross onto which he demands that Christ be nailed. The ironic juxtaposition of the two prints, the small oval immediately above annotation 21, the large Ecce Homo beside it, emphatically calls attention to the distinction Costris draws between Christian empathy and Pharisaic inhumanity in the linked annotations 21 and 25. Annotation 21 qualifies verse 21 on Simon of Kyrene, father of Alexander and Rufus, who was drafted to assist Christ carry the cross. Annotation 25 amplifies verse 25 when the R1 Christ was crucified. Together, the two annotations, like the two images, oppose respect for Jesus and hatred of him. Mark makes a point of mentioning Alexander and Rufus, speculates Costras, because sharing the burden of the cross was thought by Christ's followers to be a signal honor, the dignity of which passed from Simon to his sons, who themselves became eager Christians. On the contrary, Christ's crucifiers did everything they could to hasten the hour of his death upon the cross. Two images of Christ on the cross accompany annotation 39 and additionally, correlate to annotations 43 and 45 on page 154. The image above, depicting Jesus flanked by angels who worship the holy blood, alludes to his divinity. While the image below, showing him already dead, his side pierced by Longinus, testifies to his human mortality. The paired images thus illustrate the argument of annotation 39 asking why Mark 15, verse 39, and the centurion said, truly this man was the son of God, differs from Luke 23, verse 47, truly this was a just man. Costurus answers that the centurion must have said both things, thereby simultaneously signifying the absolute humanity of Christ and his absolute divinity. Annotation 44 elaborates upon this point, remarking that Pilate, who knew that death by crucifixion could be agonizingly slow, marveled at the quick death of Christ. He could not have known, supposes Costurus, the terrible torments Jesus suffered before he was crucified, torments intended to curtail his natural life. He then adds by reference to John 10, verses 17 to 18, no man taketh my life away from me, but I lay it down of myself, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again that no man could destroy the soul of Christ, which he alone had the power to unloose. This reference to his divine control over life and death turns on Costurus's reading of the gerund eit latende, crying out, in association with the verbal phrase geest gevende, giving the spirit up or out, or alternatively giving the spirit forth, in Mark 15 verse 37, and Jesus having cried out with a loud voice, gave up the ghost. Costurus merges the two terms using eit Latin to mean give forth from out of himself in the manner speech is let out, discharged, or exaflated. Quote, it must needs be true that no one could forcibly take from his soul, take from him his soul, which he could discharge as he wished. On this account, the two small crucifixion scenes are entirely consonant with the argument of annotations 39 and 44, that Jesus died being mortal in the flesh, and yet as God exercised full control over his death. Similarly, as the full page Ecce Homo calls upon the beholder to acknowledge the suffering humanity of Christ, so Longinus piercing the side of Christ and the full page crucifixion facing it, viewed through the lens of annotation 44, call upon the beholder to acknowledge the divine nature of Christ discernible in the Lord's death. 
What is more, annotation 43, in combination with annotations 39 and 44, connects the two crucifixion scenes by encouraging the reader-viewer to emulate two key eyewitnesses of Christ's death, Longinus and Joseph of Arimathea, whose faith was emboldened when they bore witness to the holy blood shed on Golgotha. Indeed, both images directly confront the beholder with the forward-facing body and gaze of Christ. Guided by the annotation, the viewer is prompted to respond to these prints as if she were one of these spectators whom he was seen to address from the cross. The sequence of crucifixions assists the reader-viewer more fully to relive the experiences of Longinus and Joseph. The Markan series concludes at the start of chapter 16 with an exceptionally complex full-page image collaged from two prints portraying episodes from the resurrection. The emphasis now falls on the divinity of Christ incontrovertibly validated through this great mystery. The book's owner cut the center away from a print of the resurrection perhaps engraved by Gaspar Heibrechts and pasted it onto a, a reversed copy of Schelte Abolsvert's Resurrection after Rubens. She ingeniously did this in such a way as to harmonize an image of the momentous event, which was witnessed by no one, and is yet one of the foremost articles of faith, with several evidentiary open Bachingen appearances, manifestations, open Bachingen of the risen Christ, recorded in the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John to avouch the truth of his resurrection. At the top left of the framing image sits the angel described in Matthew 28, verses 2 to 3, who descended from heaven and coming, rolled back the stone and sat upon it, his countenance and raiment bright as lightning and white as snow. At left, looking up at the angel speaking to them, stand the two women mentioned in Matthew 28, verse 1, and verses 5 to 8, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who came to see the sepulcher, and having been told not to fear, were instructed to announce to the disciples that Jesus was risen. You can just make them out in the uh, larger image on the, uh, on the right. At right, likewise gazing upward, are Peter and John, whose visit to the tomb, inspired by the report of Mary Magdalene, is recounted in John 20, verses 2 to 10. Below this scene, as narrated in Mark 16, this reveals himself to the Magdalene, their distant figures visible through a rocky archway cut into the ledge on which Peter and John stand. Below in the cartouche flanked by angels, trumpeting Christ's victory over death, he breaks bread with the two disciples at Emmaus, as recorded in Mark 16 and Luke 24. Costras licensed the illustration of these events, testifying to the resurrection in his annotations 1, 2, 7, and 9, on pages 154 to 155, between which the full-page resurrection is interpolated. Annotation 1 praises the women who set out with sweet spices to anoint Jesus, even though his body had already been lavishly anointed by Nicodemus. Their example can serve to demonstrate how no gift to the Lord is unwarranted, and how fittingly gifts are given by congregants during the offertory rite preceding the Eucharist. Annotation 2 specifies the time when the women journeyed to the sepulchre. It was daybreak just before the sun rises above the horizon, when its light shines sideways and from below, precisely as it does in the background of the resurrection and the scene of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Annotation 7 elucidates the particularizing reference to Peter in Mark 16, verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, explaining that the angel wished to affirm to Peter, still consumed by guilt at his betrayal of Jesus, that he was forgiven and must now lead his fellow apostles by example, promulgating news of the resurrection. Annotation 9, asking why none of the evangelists, unlike Saints Ambrose and Bernard, mentions that Christ, before showing himself to the Magdalene, must first have visited his mother, answers that the gospel underlined the importance of his open bachingen, in Latin, apparitionis, apparitions, 
which have a judicial evidentiary force different from the testimony of a mother on behalf of her son. This is why mothers are not called to testify and why the evangelists do not here invoke the virgin. Costarus' explanation applies to the full array of collateral scenes that accompany Bolsworth's resurrection. Appreciated in these terms, they can be identified as indexical proofs staged to corroborate the irrefutable mystery no eyes had seen. Quote, For this reason, the fact that Christ first revealed himself to the Magdalene, as is here written, must be understood to refer to the open barrenment about which the evangelists write. And that occurred as legally binding testimonies of the resurrection. For in legal matters, mothers are not customarily called to, testimony, called to give testimony about their children. Perhaps most importantly, the superimposition of one print on the other, whereby the collateral scenes function like a frame, along with the judicious cropping of the resurrection, emphasize that the mystery at issue to the extent it can be known, discerned or apprehended, must be approached through mediating though probative devices. Costras had insistently made this point in annotation two on Matthew 28, verse two, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Costras provides the following clarification. The reason for this earthquake was not that Christ arose at that moment, for as St. Jerome and other teachers state, the time of the resurrection of Christ is unknown to everyone. But one knows the time of this earthquake from the evangelists who say that it took place when the women left for the sepulchre, namely around the time of the sun's rising at dawn. Whereas in the original print, Bolsworth follows pictorial tradition, depicting several of the soldiers as witnesses to the resurrection, in particular, the helmeted guard at left who peers at the risen Christ with shock and terror, and the seated soldier and his dog at lower right who gapes startled and wide-eyed. The cropped print, after Boltzworth, deletes the background soldier and redirects the gaze of the seated soldier. By pasting the angel over the resurrection print so that he appears to perch on the top left corner, the soldier's line of sight is made to fix on him rather than Christ. The resurrection was thereby harmonized more thoroughly with the gospel account and with Costarus's annotation too, just cited. It now accentuates the post factum status of the mystery which, as the framing episodes show, was recognized in retrospect rather than observed straight away. The term harmonized best, characterize, best characterizes what's going on here. Just as a gospel harmony assembles multiple scriptural passages describing linked events and determines their temporal order, situating them on a mutually consistent timeline, so this full page image layers various events associated with the resurrection onto a print of the resurrection proper to illustrate how the latter is verified ex post facto by the former. Pasted onto Bolsworth's resurrection, the scenes of open batting become the literal or more accurately material threshold to which the earlier unseen event they corroborate is consequently, but also paradoxically seen. I say paradoxical to mark the peculiar status of the resurrection print. The angel seemingly poised on the topmost left corner and the winding sheet hanging from the tomb slab and draped over the topmost right corner, identify the resurrection as a tonkloi image in the image, having a presumed substance and density demarcated by the angel and the holy shroud. The concrete nature whereof it claims to coexist, its actuality qua image, speaks to the facticity of the resurrection but at the same time, the corollary fact that to be inferred, namely that the resurrection can be known only representationally by way of a pictorial image, reveals that the event qua mystery is elusive to human sense. If it must be visualized as an image, plausible yet admittedly imagined, it must also be taken on faith as an irrefutable factum quod ultimum. The full page construction owns up to its curiously determinate indeterminate character at the lower right join 
between the frame and Bolzberg's print. Cutting around the seated figure of the dumbfounded soldier, the book's owner diverged from the straight lines of the framing print's other inner edges. She cut into the boulder on which Peter and John stand, giving it the appearance of a ledge that partially overlaps the, the soldier. In this one place, the two images merge. The trompe l'oeil effect vanishes, so that the resurrection seems to share the space and ontological status of the adjacent scene, open barren. The constructed image fully accords with Kostris's annotations in that both the picture and the textual glosses function as hermeneutic machinae, apparatus, that bring a sacred mystery into conversation with its evidentiary open barrenness, its revelatory after effects. The theme of bearing witness to Christ both externally and internally, along with the collateral theme of testifying to the signs of his death and resurrection, humanity and divinity, constitutes the organizing topic around which two of the most conspicuous openings in his New Testament are organized. These occur at the beginning of John 20, where two elaborate openings have been inserted. The first consists of two large cutouts of women wearing archaic Burgundian dress that front a full page image of the resurrection. Directly thereafter, a full page image of the risen Christ appearing to the Magdalene in the garden, engraved and or published by Alexander Foot, confronts another large cutout of a woman who must be the eponymous Mary Magdalene. All three women acknowledge the beholder looking out of the image while drawing attention to the event pictured on the facing page. The first two with their left hands, the third who is also the most richly dressed with her right. The paired women function as scriptural tags that allude to other key passages on the resurrection. Luke 24 verse 10, for example which identifies them as Joanna and Mary of James, who told these things to the apostles. The good news they deliver is recounted in Luke 23, verses 2 to 7. Having found the tombstone rolled back, they were met by two men in shining apparel, who announced that Jesus was risen in fulfillment of the words he spoke. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day he shall rise again. Alternatively, Mark 16, verse 1, identifies them as Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, who visited the tomb early on the day after the crucifixion, hoping to anoint Christ's body, and discovered sitting there a young man clothed in a white robe, who instructed them to tell the disciples and Peter that Christ was risen. Both Luke and Mark say that Mary Magdalene accompanied the other women, but harmonizing these passages with John 20, verses 1 to 2 on the Magdalene's rash reaction to what she saw, seeing the stone taken away, she ran therefore and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple. Costras hypothesizes that immediately upon catching sight of the open sepulcher, she fled rather than drawing closer, abandoning her fellow mourners, Joanna and Mary, or Mary and Salome. This explains why the book's owner separated her out from the other two witnesses to the resurrection. The annotations to chapters 18 and 19 of John consistently focus on the theme of faithful testimony, tonin in Dutch, showing forth, open like Satan, speaking openly, kennen geven, making known. The thematic of attestation plainly underlies the cutouts, deictic gestures of pointing, which can equally be read as declarative gestures of showing. The annotations to chapters 20, as noted above, supplement this theme by dwelling on the pekinen, the signs, or by the witnesses who show, speak about, and disclose the mysteries of the passion and resurrection in John 18 and 19, came to recognize what they then promulgate in John 20. What was the source of the signs they observed, asks Costerus, and how did they ascertain the truth of the things they were given to know? His comments read in tandem with the adjacent pictorial apparatus raise questions about the precise character and status of the images of the resurrection and Christ appearing to the Magdalene. Take the former. Since they did not see the resurrection 
qua event, which had already transpired before they re reached the sepulchre, the respective image would seem to represent the event as they imagine it to have occurred, inspired by the angel's testimony. Understood in these terms, the image is doubly mediated, which is to say testimonial, because it stands for their visual testimony drawn from the angel's testimony. The image, however, may also be interpreted as an artifice, a sacred image qua image of the type defended by Costrius in his preface to Het New Testament. In that case, the women would be beckoning us to look at an actual picture plausibly evocative of the great mystery seen by no one, yet visualizable nonetheless. And the resurrection, recognizable as an image of the resurrection, would draw attention to the condition and representability itself, its medium, engraving, standing for the various other media, painting, drawing, etc., wherein knowledge of the mystery may be disseminated. This kind of self-referential image is once again doubly mediated, the pictorial redaction of a sacred mystery that testifies to the faith of these women by converting into a picture the internal image first conjured up by the angel's words. The ambiguous status of the resurrection, what kind of sign is it, causes the viewer to pause over the question of what it means to evince or signify something. By foregrounding this activity, the pendant prints of the paired women in the resurrection accord with Costrius's annotations about the manner and meaning of bearing witness to Christ. Additionally, the potentially twofold status of the resurrection, mental image or pictorial one, places a certain pressure on the sign itself, bringing, bringing forward the taken that makes the mystery manifest, at least partially, as a complementary topic in its own right. The relation between the Magdalene and Christ appearing to the Magdalene is somewhat different since the latter can surely be construed as a mnemonic image of an event she actually experienced. Whether she is seen to bear witness to the event it itself or to a pictorial image of it matters less than the specific fact that she is pointing at herself, asking us to consider how she, in her meeting with the risen Christ, came to realize that the gardener was he. Inscribed with an excerpt from Canticle 3, verse 4, I have found him whom my soul loveth, the print depicts the exact moment when the Magdalene's eyes were opened and she discovered her Lord standing before her. In fact, following pictorial tradition, it amplifies the circumstances described in John 20, corresponding more closely with Costurus's account of the encounter in Annotation 16. Here he relates how she came to discern the presence of Christ by focusing on the visual and verbal taken signs he dispensed, at last becoming attentive to the sight and sound of him. Quote, he spoke to her with his accustomed voice and showed her his accustomed form. She cast her eyes hither and thither, trying to see where she might find his body. Upon hearing the voice of Christ, she turned round fully and falling to the ground desired to touch his feet and kiss them as was her wont. And with great affection, she said, Rabboni, that is, Master, Master, are you nigh how I longed for you and how downcast I became at your death? Annotation 17 contains a fuller discussion of her reaction to the signs Christ deduced and why he stopped her from touching him. One line of thought says Costos has it that he wished to distinguish her from Thomas and the other disciples. Unlike them, she had no need further to verify belief in the resurrection, her faith having been perfected by the taken she had just seen and heard. Another line of thought has to do with the qualities she failed to discern, recalling prior signs of his divinity seen during his life, his body radiant with grace and the bodily miracles he performed. She neglected to observe that his risen body was more glorious than before, its current form transcendent of mere touch. By telling the Magdalene to forbear, he was giving her a sacramental sign, adverting to the Eucharist as the true means whereby the corporeal and spiritual food of Christ may henceforth be touched and tasted in this life. And finally, he was signifying what he wished her to convey to the apostles and disciples. Glorified by the mystery of the resurrection, his body, now immortal, different from the body they had previously known, and consequently, being more heavenly than terrestrial, though it deserves to be revered by all his followers. 
it must now be handled as before, it must not be handled as before. Costarus emphasizes that Jesus too was reading signs, though with the utmost acuity, for he recognized how recursive was the Magdalene's devotion, based as it was on her past experience of his holy body. As that body has been renewed, so her experience of it must be reformed. Taken as a whole, these annotations have special relevance for the Magdalene as portrayed in the engraving by Foot, where her meeting with Christ shows her to be a keen reader of signs. They also redound upon the silhouetted figure on the facing page. By pointing at an image of herself, that figure designates the other Magdalene, a taken of faith in the mystery of the resurrection. She thus stands, one might say, at the hinge between the two themes Costros explores in the final chapters of John, the necessity of bearing witness to Christ, the author of faith, and reliance on signs, both visual and verbal, as the necessary means of shoring up faith in the great mysteries, the resurrection above all, or of the church as the chief custodian. Further annotations on divinely sanctioned taken in ripple out from the annotations on the Magdalene and function like the links of a chain connecting pendant images. The ones just discussed, for example, with a pendant pair interposed between pages 364 and 365 that closes John 20. Engraved by Peter de Bayou after Theodor von Tolden and published by Gaspar Heibrecht, these full page inserts display living effigies of the risen Christ and the Virgin set upon sockles for a continuous landscape that stretches between the two plates. Reduced to four figures, Jesus, Mary, John, and the centurion piercing Christ's side, the crucifixion scene that plays out in the distant background is meditative rather than historical. A prayerful image purposefully designed to distill three key themes central to the mystery of the passion, the death of Christ, the compassion of Mary and John, and the conversion of the centurion. The effigies of Christ and the Virgin likewise take the form of meditative images. Their appearance, entirely lifelike, like patently sculptural, drives home the point that they are imagines agentes, mental images artificially produced from memory, that represent for the purpose of meditation, Christ as the glorified Son of God. And this is why there's, he's, he has a Trinitarian hero, Cairo, triumphant over death, who reveals himself to Mary, his chief votary. He bows down, humbly acknowledging his, she bows down, humbly acknowledging his divinity and expresses her great love, gesturing to her heart. In this way, Jesus and Mary, rather than directly engaging in an encounter predicated on the resurrection, represented at one remove in the fashion of a signifying referent. They are pictorial, sculptural, taken in of the same mystery broadcast by the image of Christ appearing to the Magdalen, signal, signal again at one removed by the adjacent figure of the Magdalene. The mutually responsive gestures of Jesus and Mary evoke an apocryphal extra scriptural subject. The risen Christ's first visitation, which was to the Virgin, codified as a meditative spiritual exercise by Lodolphus of Saxony in the Vita Christi at Ignatius of Loyola in the Exequitia Spiritualia. In annotation 9 of Mark 16, cited earlier in the paper, Costras had written about the peculiar nature of the encounter, more than plausible, if not indubitable, yet not certified by scripture. Their reunion signifies the undying love of Jesus and Mary, even if being extra-biblical, it cannot be adduced as an incontrovertible sign that gives statutory testimony of the resurrection. Quote, having risen in the morning on the first day of the week, Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene, but not before our dear lady, who was the first, say Saints Ambrose and Bernard, to see the risen Christ, before any other person, either at her home, as is commonly opined, or by the sepulchre, where she awaited the resurrection for three days, as Metaphrastes, amongst other Greek theologians, writes. For no one loved Christ so greatly, nor was anyone closer to him than his mother, no one had more ardently desired his homecoming, no suffered more fully with him in his holy passion, and no other was more worthy to be consoled. 
Therefore, when it here says that Christ first appeared to the Magdalene, that must be understood to refer to the appearances about which the evangelists write, which took place to give legally binding testimony of his resurrection. The first appearance of the risen Christ, in that it has no scriptural warrant, is to be appreciated as a credible, though unproven taken, sign of the resurrection. Since the episode is not irrefragable, the image that portrays it insists on its own representational status. The pendant prince avouched that the scene is factitious, even if entirely plausible, and accordingly it has been staged as ostensibly representable, presented in the most explicit terms as a work of art. If the Vita Christi and Exequitia Spiritualia, in the Vita Christi and Exequitia Spiritualia, the episode is intimately associated with meditation upon the mystery of the resurrection. The paired prince, as we have seen, by purporting to represent pendant sculptures of Jesus and Mary, frankly acknowledge that one is dealing with manufactured images. This acknowledgement comports with the meditative source of the portrayed scene, for Ludolphus and Ignatius, in their spiritual exercises, empower the exorcitant actively to fabricate his or her own imaginis agentis. The annotations about the prevalence of taken in, in John 20 conclude by parsing the evangelist's unequivocal endorsement of signs in verses 30 to 31. Quote, many other signs taken in also did Jesus in the sight of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John is distinguishing says Costras, between his gospel, which was written primarily to attest the divinity of Christ, and the synoptic gospels, which describe many other miracles performed by him. Everything so described can be visualized on faith, but such matters have a lesser importance than the Lord's divinity, for it is a key doctrine of faith. Without professing it, along with the 11 other points of doctrine summarized in the Apostles' Creed, one cannot claim to be a Christian. The Tekanen, John records and describes the resurrection above all, are thus the sine qua non, without faith in which one cannot be saved. With regard to the other matters, significant as they are, one need only refrain from obstinately denying them. On the contrary, the truth of the resurrection known after the fact, by, the way, by way of the signs left in its wake, must be embraced thoroughly. The three sets of pendant images in John 20 illustrate these signs. The Magdalene and the pair of holy women present themselves as living signs of the mystery whose existence their testimony allows us to construe as true and representable. The Virgin submits to the power of the mystery she beholds in and through the risen Christ, their entire encounter entirely comprised by images alluding to the power of Pekinen visually to convey the truth of this great mystery. Underlying these readings of the term taken is its usage in workshop parlance and our theoretical discourse, wherein the verb taken in signifies to delineate. Takening is an image made up of lines, and taken const is the art of portraying people or things with lines. Implicit in the term then is a reference to linear images, more specifically to the evidentiary value of the kinds of prints executed in contour lines, hatches, and cross-hatching that populate this copy of Het New Testament. In this context, they can be appreciated as specimens of takening that lay bare the signifying function of the scriptural proof takenen, proof signs of the resurrection discussed in Kostras' annotations. Thanks so much for your attention to the, uh, to the lecture. Apologies. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Now we hear you. Sorry. Um, wonderful, wonderful discussion of this incredibly 
beautiful customized book, beautifully analyzed. Thank you, Walter. So we already have about, actually we're up to eight questions here in our Q&A box. Just a reminder that if you have a question, please put it into the Q&A text box and I will see them and read them out. We may not get to all of them. And if that's the case, I will make sure Walter gets the questions and he can respond to you via email. Okay, our first question came in from Ann Kustale. She asks, would you give us some idea of the specific sources Kosteris draws upon? And she wrote this question early in your talk. I'm interested in which works of Augustine and Gregory the Great he employs. Thank you. You did answer just a little bit, but if you could maybe explain. Yeah, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful question. And uh, Kosteris uh, was a doctor of theology and he took the uh, theology degree degree at the University of Cologne, so he was a very learned theologian himself. He knew virtually the entire uh, Augustinian corpus, including works we now uh, consider apocryphal, and, and uh, one of the works he uh, particularly consulted was the Sermone Domini in Monte, uh, uh, in Monte. and so it was really uh, the homilies on, on uh, the uh, Augustine's uh, homilies that uh, Costris uh, consulted, and of course he consulted very, very closely. In fact, he probably knew by heart the Enoraciones in uh, in uh, Salmos, and of course he knew the uh, uh, Epistolae of Gregory the Great. Uh, he was just extremely well versed in all of the fathers, and not just the Latin fathers, also the Greek fathers. And uh, and one of the uh, wonderful things about his annotations in Dutch is that although many of them consist of compilations of patristic citations, so basically the annotation becomes itself a kind of patristic compilatio in a way on the model of what's going on in the Glossa Ordinaria, in the Glossa Ordin, uh, or Ordinaria, it was one of the ways in, in which uh, large chunks of the fathers could circulate and did circulate uh, in, um, in uh, in, in Dutch. And he also knew extremely well um, uh, theological readings of the fathers. And in particular, he consulted Alfonso Salmeron and Juan uh, Maldonado, as well as Cardinal Bellarmine. I mean, not surprisingly, he consults the Jesuits. He consults the Jesuits first, but he was also a close reader of uh, the works of Ruard Papper. Uh, T-A-P-P-E-R, and uh, Cornelius uh, Jan, uh, Jan Senius, uh, amongst others. And something I, I didn't mention because I, I didn't have time, um, your, your question makes me, makes me think about this, is he was vice provincial of Germania Inferior, which is uh, the Jesuit province of the uh, Low Countries in the, in the 16th century. Um, in the 16th century uh, during the iconoclasm. And this is one of the reasons uh, images are so foregrounded in almost everything Kosteris writes. They really are important for him. And he experienced at first hand image destruction in the, uh, in the Low Countries. And this is one of the reasons he goes through every patristic source and every conciliar source he can find so that he knows precisely what the fathers and the councils have to say about images and image use. Wonderful. So Mike Kaczynski has a question that follows up well after this one. He says, this is a fascinating lecture. Are there any medieval antecedents for the idea of understanding a visual image as a gloss on a scriptural text, rather than, for example, simply a reaction to or art object inspired by the text? Yes, yes, there are. And Catherine Rudy has recently published, I, I think it's Braypoles that published a really fabulously interesting book. And, and it's on what she calls manuscript postcards. And this is so interesting that many um, uh, 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 workshops that specialized in the illumination of manuscripts produced um, images on parchment that then were marketed to be pasted into manuscripts. It was one of the ways in which you could, you could convert a uh, handwritten manuscript into an illuminated manuscript. And the earliest uh, prayer books that uh, use printed images that I've seen uh, 
seem to be doing that on the model of these, um, again, to quote uh, uh, Kate Rudy, uh, uh, illuminated postcards. Uh, though these, these prayer books with printed images begin to appear almost at the same time that those manuscript postcards are circulating. So it may actually be a parallel, pheno parallel phenomenon. And, um, and another thing that happens, which is very interesting, I, I've seen uh, uh, numerous examples of this, is that there are uh, manuscript prayer books and um, that uh, are illustrated with pasted in prints. So it was one of the things people, people did and uh, the pasted in prints comment on uh, the uh, text and they're almost always in very pertinent and very interesting places and they're almost always in the margins. And in that sense, they're exactly where a scriptural gloss might, might uh, be. What I find interesting about the, the prayer books I'm, I'm working on is that the writing is always around the images. So, so the writing is a response to the images. And even when they're using extremely conventional standard prayers, the prayers are always adapted to the presence of the image in some way. So there really is a very emphatic response to the, um, the presence of the image. The Costras um, uh, New Testament is really a special, a special case. I mean, what, what I think is going on there, one of the things that's going on there is, is, is that by pasting in and binding in the image as a supplement to the glosses, not only are the images glossing scripture, the images are also glossing the glosses, the gloss scripture. So it's a kind of double gloss. And, and the, um, the manuscript background for that would be the great tradition of manuscripts of the glossa ordinaria, so the ordinary and common glosses, which in the 14th century expand to incorporate Nicholas de Lyra's glosses, and then those expand to incorporate Paulus de Burgos's, and it goes on and on and on. And, and, and you're probably familiar with this, and so you get the scripture in the middle, and then you get a frame of glosses around that, and another frame of glosses around that, and another frame of glosses around that. And that, I think, is the format of books like like the Costras New Testament, and to some extent also the format of, of, of um, the glossing that is going on in these prayer books, where, where you might expect to find a textual gloss instead you're finding a visual, mm -hmm. a visual gloss. So Claudia Swan has a good question about the images. Uh, oh, she, hi, she, she writes, this is absolutely fascinating. What a marvel of a book. Thank you for your open bar and presentation, Walter. <laughs> My question has to do with dating. I wonder whether the cut out and pasted prints all date to the early 17th century. Do you have a guess about when the book was annotated in this extraordinary way with images? And are any other copies annotated by individual owners to the best of your knowledge? And, and when, when you say copies, you mean of the New Testament, right? Of I the think Cosmos. that's what she means, okay. yeah. I, I, know you're still none, there. I know of none. This, this uh, uh, copy in the Moritza Bay Bibliothèque is is extraordinary, but but I would be surprised if there aren't more. Um, in part because uh, the the book has very 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 wide margins, and and um, uh, so often I mean some of the annotations go on for pages, and then the margins are completely filled with text. But there are other annotations that that are quite short, and then the margins are are, are, are would leave lots of space. And, and also um, because, because the typographer, it's a beautifully produced book, is trying to, uh, to coordinate scripture with the annotations. Very often there's a lot of margin above or below the scriptural text. And, and so this leaves a lot of room for the owner of the book actually to, to write into the book. And, and the person who owned this copy said, oh look, there's lots of room for images here and, and responded accordingly. It's, it's a good question. I know of, of no other copies, but I would not be surprised if other copies that have been annotated uh, pop up, though I doubt I'm ever going to 
encounter one as lavish. I mean, there really are hundreds of prints in it. It is so extraordinary. But there is very little annotation after the Acts of the Apostles. So there's very little visual annotation of the epistles. And then there is heavy visual annotation again of, of uh, the um, Apocalypse. And you find this too in illustrated Bibles that there are certain books which have, which have, which almost have almost no uh, yeah Claudia Claudia actually follows up and says she means precisely annotating with images, not text. Annotating with images, yeah. not text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for prayer books, uh, I mean there are, there are hundreds of these prayer books. I mean, it's just a very rich topic. There are lots of them all over the place. It's really really interesting. Uh, and what what I'm writing about are the manuscript prayer books but I'm incorporating this because it's so interesting. So I have to justify it because everything else in the book is really manuscript with printed images. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so this is, and this is the latest example I use. Your earlier question, it's a really good question. Virtually every print in the book dates from the mid 17th century. So I am assuming that it is around then that this particular um, book was, was, was annotated. And by then it was several years old. In the, um, in the diocesan synod that was convened in Ghent in 1650, the synod specifically endorsed Kostras's Dutch translation of the New Testament and said people should read it. Mm -hmm. And, and that would be another reason why people may have paid particular attention to it in the mid 17th century, even though it was already several decades old and had not been republished. But, and I don't know how many publications there were in 60, how many Trognesius published in 1614, but I suspect a, a, goodly, uh, a goodly number, but it must, might be one of the reasons why um, whoever owned this book, um, paid such attention to it around mid-century because that's when most of the print, that's when most of the printmakers and publishers of these prints issued them. And I mean, for example, you notice there's, there's virtually, it's really interesting, there's virtually none of those uh, gorgeous little prints that the Collarts and the Hullas and the Virixes produced at the big, late, in the late 16th Not century there. for the first two decades of the 17th century. And, having worked with a lot of these prayer books, I think now a lot of those smaller images were made precisely to be pasted into these mm -hmm. kinds of books. This does not have those images and it has a lot of the, uh, the later ones. When the image is big, what they did is they bound it into the book, uh, which is quite interesting. And very often in that case, what they did was to paste two big images back to back and then bind the two into into the book. Fascinating. So we still have several questions. It's already 105, but impressively, we still have 84 participants with us. Oh my goodness. So I want to turn to Mara Wade's question about gender. The insertion of female figures as witnesses is very interesting and suggests a potential gender aspect of this volume. Was the owner possibly a woman? which you sort of hinted at. Do we know anything about its provenance? And then she follows up. Also, the fact that women, specifically the Magdalene, appear as illegally binding witnesses in Costras' exegesis. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. And, and uh, it's, it's wonderful the way he uses um, his argument about the Virgin being the first person that Jesus undoubtedly visited, even though there's no scriptural attestation for this, there is patristic exegetical attestation for it, and then goes to the Magdalene and says, well, the Magdalene's witness, because it's scriptural, has a, a, probative, uh, a probative value, and, and we should believe that he first visited the Virgin, but the, Mag the, visit, the, the, the encounter with the Magdalene it has the status of a document you would present in court. It has a legal, legally binding status. That's very interesting. I think it's, it may be, it, it could very well be a, uh, a wealthy woman, possibly a woman who was a member of an elite convent uh, who owned this book, or it might be 
a group of women who owned this book and it was a kind of corporate, it was the corporate property of that uh, convent or it might be a spiritual advisor to that community who put it together in collaboration with that community, but the intensity of identification with the Virgin Mary and the Magdalene within the meditative literature crosses gender lines. And, and so the, the prominence of the Virgin and the Magdalene and of Joanna and Mary Salome, I mean, there is such a strong identification with those visual witnesses to, to Christ. And there is such a strong identification with um, the bride from the canticle. Um, and, uh, and that identification very much crosses gender lines. So a case could be made, a very strong case for this, but a, but a, a strong case could still be made for this belonging to a, a Jesuit father or a Carmelite, because the Carmelites were often very friendly to the Jesuits. I mean, the fact that there are so many um, Jesuit-inspired uh, images in the book doesn't necessarily mean that this is this was owned by the, the Jesuits. I mean, it could be um, nuns. There's, there's, no, numbers, but there's no signs. There's no names in. Uh, unfortunately, no. None that yeah. I've I've seen, or that none that the, the that uh, that the Moritz. Yeah. Abbey, as far as I, I know. Uh, has uh, has found, yeah, I, wouldn't I that should, be nice? I should note that Many Annie... of the prayer books, I would say that more than half of the prayer books I've been working on belong to women. Mm. And, they, and they make that very, very clear in the prayers. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the language of the prayers is she and her, and the references mm -hmm. are to my fellow sisters. Mm -hmm. It's just made very, very, uh, very, very clear. And then very often in those prayer books, uh, when gold and silver applied, gold and silver especially applied to the infant Jesus and to the Virgin Mary. Okay, how about one last question here? Um, and I'm sorry to those that we can't get to today, but I, as I mentioned, I will make sure Walter gets your question. So Daniel Cheely asks, thank you, or says, thank you so much for your illuminating presentation. A couple of questions for you about format in comparison to the English Catholic New Testament 1582, which is formatted differently. Would you be able to tell us anything about how common black letter type is for Dutch biblical volumes in the early 17th century? And how common it was at that time to format glosses around the scriptural text in the manner of a medieval gloss, instead of at the end of it, like endnotes, in the manner of the English Catholic New Testament first published in 1582? It's a good history of the book question. That's a really good thing. That's a really interesting question. I'll start with the last one. And, and what had been happening in the 16th century, it starts in the late 15th century and then throughout the 16th century, that manuscript format for the glossa, for the, um, the common and ordinary glosses with Nicholas de Lyra, so the, the uh, 14th century manuscript format, becomes typographical. And, and these extremely beautiful uh, editions of the glosses start to be published and in Lyon, in Paris, in, in, in Venice. And this book very much follows that model uh, for uh, the printing of scripture with uh, a glossed, uh, with an apparatus of glosses. And, and, uh, with, uh, and black letter is very common actually in the low countries uh, for Dutch language Bibles. It's more common than for example, uh, Roman though, um, Costras, the typography of this volume is it's just beautiful. I mean, there are um, uh, places, for example, the prefaces are very often in Roman, whereas uh, uh, black letter is used for um, other texts in, in the, uh, the Bible, but it's quite common in the uh, low countries for the scriptural text. And, and this format follows the glossa format as it was being uh, circulated uh, in uh, printed versions of the Glossa published in the uh, 16th uh, and early 17th centuries. I hope that's a sufficient uh, response. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Walter. It's been an illuminating discussion as well as presentation, and we're, we're thrilled to have you here today with us. 
uh, we're hoping to host further talks this summer and we will keep you all posted and please be in touch at renaissance at newbury.org if you have any questions or have any further qu questions for Walter in particular. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. It's really been a pleasure. Bye.